The motion on the order paper is that this House has no confidence in the Secretary of State, and I think we've already heard from the fourth and final government backbencher who's come along to speak in support of their Secretary of State. God bless them. <laughs> and the Secretary of State hasn't either stayed in the chamber uh, to listen to today's contributions. But if I was giving advice to the Minister or to the backbenchers opposite, I would suggest that they go out and buy a plaque that says the book stops here and attach it to the Secretary of State's desk because that is what this debate is all about. It's about the public wanting to elect politicians to run a decent railway system. And I congratulate my honourable friend, uh, the Shadow Secretary of State, for standing up and confidently saying that he wants to be a Secretary of State that runs the railways and that is held accountable for it. The meltdown caused by the introduction of the new rail timetable in May is just the latest in a chain of crises on our railways. We have, overly, we have an overly complex and fractured rail system. It has too many operators and a complex web of contractors and subcontractors. And this patchwork of competing interests mitigates against effective planning and delivery of the railway, making Britain's railway one of the most expensive and now worst run rail systems in Europe. Since 2010, fares have risen three times faster than wages, and in January we had the highest fare increases for five years, not to mention the more than £5 billion of public money used to subsidise the rail uh, network every year. It seems to me that incompetent rail companies have now become too big to fail in the eyes of this Government. The rewards are privatised, but the risks are dumped on passengers and taxpayers, who always end up footing the bill. The public are tired of paying the price for a broken, privatised and franchised model. And is it any surprise because they're getting what they're getting in return? Higher fares for a worse service, botched timetables and thousands of cancellations. And a policy of de-staffing the railways in the interests of profit, regardless of the consequences for both staff and the travelling public. And Madam Deputy Speaker, one of the first campaigns I backed following my election in June last year was the RMT's campaign to keep the guard on the train. After Merseyrail announced that they were planning to axe all 207 guards from the service when the new fleet arrives in 2020. My constituents welcomed the introduction of new and modern trains, something long overdue and that the unions themselves campaigned for. But they also value the safety and security of the guard on the train. Private rail companies are making huge profits from the travelling public, and it's completely wrong that we are presented with false choices between embracing new technology and protecting secure jobs and public safety. It's a nonsense. The campaign has enjoyed the overwhelming support of the public despite strikes, and I'm glad that Mersey Rail have now recognised the strength of feeling and that talks at ACAS are now taking place. Both the Scottish and Welsh governments have agreed that there will be no extension of driver-only operation on services yeah, yeah, yeah. that they are responsible for. And I hope Mersey Rail will follow suit so that passengers in my constituency are afforded the same standards of safety as are enjoyed elsewhere. But since the appointment of the Secretary of State for Transport, the RMT fears he is blocking any similar deals being made in an effort to take on the union. And these fears were again confirmed when the Public Accounts Committee recently produced a report on franchising which concluded that the blame for the protracted Southern DOO dispute laid squarely at the door of the Government for not engaging properly with the trade unions. The franchising system fails to allow for industrial relations at all. Train operating companies have little interest beyond the term of their franchise agreements and changes are routinely forced through without any serious consultation. And the introduction of the May 2018 timetable required changes on a huge scale. Change requires the cooperation, the engagement, the goodwill of the workforce which has been undermined constantly by both the rail companies themselves and the government's handling of the DOO dispute. The rail industry lacks a clear chain of command and clear lines of accountability, so it's easy to blame others. Ultimately, though, the book stops with the Transport Absolutely. Secretary. Yeah. Yeah. 
Not only has he failed on a managerial level, but he has defended at every turn the systemic failure of rail privatisation. So my advice to him is simple. First, take responsibility, and second, listen to the public, who by a vast majority support a return to public ownership and public control of our railways. Yeah, yeah, yeah.